Simon, I really want to know what reality is all about. And I hear this philosophical dispute between realism and anti-realism. Well, on the surface, I don't want to know anything about anti-realism. <laughs> how can I understand uh, how this can help me? Well, I think there are two kinds of problem about realism. Um, one is the general problem, which is illustrated by Descartes' Evil Demon, by films like The Matrix. Uh, do we live in the reality that we think we do and that we um, generally presume we do, uh, the reality of chairs and tables and space and cities and the world, or is it all a dream? And that's Descartes' problem and it's a general problem. Um, so the evil the, demon is, is, is somebody who's uh, manipulating all my brain cells so that I think I'm seeing you, but I'm really just uh, being manipulated in some abstract way. Yes, exactly. The update is often the mad scientist who's plonked your brain in a vat and is feeding you signals as if right. you're living a life of the kind you take yourself to be living. Um, and uh, really, there's only a dream going on or only an illusion. So that's the big problem. There are then more local problems of realism and anti-realism. Um, most of the things we talk about we're pretty happy with. They're good solid objects like chairs and tables. But we also deal in terms of things like possibilities. We deal in terms of numbers. Uh, we have things like moral facts. And those sort of fit uncomfortably into the common sense world. Uh, for example, you can't take a number and put it in a bucket or um, measure its weight or volume or anything. It has no such properties. No um, age. No age, exactly. <laughs> it seems to be timeless. And then there's a the question of what is it? Uh, are we right to think there is such a thing? How would we know about it if there was such a thing, if it's got no physical effects on us? Uh, and so on. So those are local problems of reality. Uh, do numbers belong to reality? Do moral facts belong to reality? Um, and uh, realism and anti-realism are the two opposite sides on those questions. So define for me for a minute each one in its own way, realism and anti-realism. Right. Well, realism will take whatever the topic is, let's say numbers, for example, uh, and say there really are numbers. They may be strange, they may have timeless properties. Uh, it's rather obscure what kind of thing they can be. Uh, but we have to refer to them, we have to uh, accept them into our, well, what philosophers call our ontology. That is, they, uh, they are fully-fledged denizens of reality. <laughs> um, this is Plato's uh, uh, world yeah, of forms. Mathematical Platonism is a, uh, is a very um, uh, salient example of a realism, exactly. Or again, if it was, say, ethics, a realist about ethics is going to say there really are moral facts. There are things out there to get right or wrong. Um, it's Independent not, of our own views. Exactly. Uh, we have to measure up. We have to get the moral facts right. We have to get uh, uh, the correct opinions about duties and rights and wrongs and values and so on. Now, it seems from just thinking about it that numbers would have a more... A vigorous claim to reality than moral principles. Yes, um, partly because the disputes don't break out in mathematics in the same way they do in ethics, so there seems to be a unanimity of opinion, at least at the uh, sort of classical um, numerical or geometrical level. Um, in ethics, of course, disputes are part of the turf. Right. Um, the So that's one thing. The other thing is, of course, science can't do without numbers, and science in many people's minds, is the arbiter of what there is. Um, science tells us what the world is, uh, contains. And if science can't do without numbers, then we had jolly well better put up with numbers. On the other hand, science does seem to most people to be able to do without ethics. Um, <laughs> sometimes rather too much, so yeah, perhaps. Yeah. Um, but scientists don't deal with values, rights, duties, obligations. So if we use science as the arbiter of reality, you're absolutely right. Numbers have a better claim than uh, the moral facts or the rights, duties, and the rest of them. So look, I can follow that. I can follow what a realist is. My natural inclination would be to be a realist mm -hmm. trained as a scientist. Right. So help me on the other side. If, if I were to be an anti-realist, right. what would I believe and why would I believe it? Well, anti-realists can, can come in a number of flavors. Um, as always. As always. Uh, the out-and-out anti-realist might just say he's a skeptic or an eliminativist is the 
term that's often used. I mean, somebody just thinks we ought to eliminate this branch of discourse. So, for example, um, take, say, theological talk. Um, some people might believe that there's a God. They think God is an element in reality. They're realists about God. Other people might go to the other extreme and say, you know, all this theological talk is just junk. We should not be thinking in these terms even. That's eliminativism. In between, there are people who say, well, I'm not quite so hostile to the discourse. I don't mind people talking and thinking in God terms. But you mustn't think in terms of realism. You mustn't think in terms of a three-decade universe with heaven up there, the earth here, and perhaps hell down below. Um, you ought to see God talk in different terms. For example, poetical, symbolical, metaphorical, uh, and religious practices become more like dances, songs, rituals. <clears throat> so those people would be uh, hospitable to the discourse. They say the language is fine. You know, go and read the Bible. It's great. But we're not dealing with a description of an aspect of the world. We're dealing with a different kind of, uh, and the, the term often used is language game. We're mm. dealing with a different kind of activity. We're not describing an aspect of reality anymore. Now, the claims of anti-realism go beyond gods or theology yeah, sure. to, to where if I were a full-blown anti-realist, I might think that uh, the whole world is a construction of my own mind. Right. Is, is yeah. that right? <laughs> yes, that's, uh, that's the position known as idealism. Right. And um, you are right. It's a, that would be a general position, usually associated with Bishop Berkeley in right. the early 18th century. Um, the, I, I just would use theology as an example of a kind of position you could have, or a number of positions you could have about a number of issues. So in theology, we've had the realist, that's the orthodox, as it were, uh, face value view of the, mm -hmm. uh, the enterprise. Uh, we have the, the eliminativist says, let's get rid of it. And in between, we have people who say, let's construe the language in a slightly different way, see the activity slightly differently. Um, and in theology, that would be in terms of dance, rituals, practices, congregations, and so on. Um, if you take a different topic, like, say, ethics, you could, in principle, have the same trio. Mm. You could have the realist, who says there are rights and duties, and it's our job to know about them, to get them right. You've got the eliminativist, who says, Go, you know, it's, a, it's all a matter of opinion. You can, you can make it up as you go along. Subjectivism. Subjectivist, yes. Mm -hmm and it's not as important as it's usually supposed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the middle, you might have someone who says, well, we're not describing an aspect of reality. We may be doing something else, like swapping attitudes or uh, expressing emotions or laying down permissions and obligations and things on each other. And that's a practice, and it's a perfectly decent practice, but it's not describing an aspect of reality. And that would be, a, as it were, a more accommodating kind of anti-realism. It would be saying, it's in a sense a construction, uh, but don't look down on it because of that. Would you call that a quasi-realist? Yes, that's the territory <laughs> that quasi-realists in. Um, and that's what you are? Uh, yes, that's, uh, oh. that's, uh, it's not a term I'm terribly proud of, but I'm landed with it. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, 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 the landscape, when I started to use that term, was very much divided between realists and a number of people called error theorists, of whom the most distinguished was a man called John Mackey, who wrote a very, very influential book in 1977 on ethics, it was a penguin, uh, in which he argued that really most of our ordinary thought, when we think in terms of morality and values, is founded on an error a metaphysical error, the error of supposing that there are these goods, these properties, these mm. platonic universals, um, and there aren't any. Um, since there aren't any, uh, most of our moral thought is in error. That was the error theory. Um, and I want to say no. I want to share John Mackey's suspicion of Platonism, um, but I don't want to go the whole way with the error theorist. It's not a fiction that we make up. It's not a fiction that say, I've got a duty to my children. I think I do have a duty to my children. I want to thump the table and insist on that. Uh, and if you, for example, attacked me out of the blue, I'd think you'd done something awful and I'd be very indignant. 
So I wanted to protect our attitudes and emotions. Uh, I also wanted to protect the idea that there's something to get right or wrong, that there's, there are better or worse views to be had about our values and our duties and our obligations. Um, so the question was, could I do that without tipping over into Platonism or realism? And quasi-realism was the, the <laughs> result. It was a, uh, usually described as an attempt to have your cake and eat it. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's, that's how the term came about. I, I'm not sure it was an ideal term, but it's my own, and <laughs> I'm stuck with it. <laughs>